Good afternoon. For those who attended the very uh, exciting Society Day, welcome back. And to those who are here for the SDM US Conference 2015, I want to give you a warm welcome. I am Darrell Gunter, the Director of Membership for STM. And we're going to talk about disruption to eruption, accelerating the advance of scholarly communications. But before we get started, I want to introduce our chair, Jane Marks, who's the vice president of Walters Kluwer. Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Darrell. And I'd like to add my thanks to uh, the speakers and to Darrell and the organizing committee for the day we had today on society publishing. It was a really interesting day. It was very well attended. Um, and so I think for, for those of us who attended today, it was a, um, a, an instructional day. So thank you to the speakers who came along today. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, couple of days of, of more interesting discussions, and particularly discussions about disruption. You know, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. We've been talking about this for a long time. Um, there's all kinds of things that come and um, challenge us in scholarly publishing and the next big thing is going to cause the end of publishing as we know it, and we get over that, and it becomes business as usual. And then another thing comes along. So um, wherever we are in that disruption to eruption process, I hope you get something out of the next couple of days. Whatever it is, good or bad, please let us know. That's one of the things that we really like. We pay a lot of attention to the feedback you give us um, at each of these conferences. And um, hopefully you see, as you give us feedback, then the, uh, the program shapes to what you're interested in seeing, what you like, um, and what you want to see more of. So um, welcome to the meeting. And the first um, speaker, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jeffrey Beale, who is going to talk to us this afternoon. I heard him speak a couple of years ago at an ISMTE meeting. It was an extremely interesting um, very informative talk. Um, he has promised me he's not just going to be interesting today, he's going to be somewhat disruptive. Um, and he has promised me faithfully, but at the end of his talk, you will all be awake. So I am even more interested now in hearing what he's got to say. So I hope you'll give a big round of applause to Jeffrey Beale. Thank you very much, Jane. Scholarly Publishing, The View from 5,280 Feet is my presentation's title, and the altitude is a reference to Denver, Colorado, where I live, which lies at an elevation of 5,280 feet, one mile, or about 1,609 meters. Next month, on May 14th, to be exact, I'll mark 25 years of working as an academic librarian. I graduated with a master's degree in library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's School of Information and Library Science in May 1990. I had already been offered and accepted a job several months earlier, a position that was held open for me pending my successful completion of library school. Uh, this position was at Harvard University's Widener Library, where I worked for 10 years, and I began working at the University of Colorado Denver in 2000. I should also say that my first real scholarly publication was an article entitled Describing the Foreign Language Skills of Catalogers and Academic Libraries, and it was published in 1992 in Cataloging and Classification Quarterly, a journal then published by Hayworth Press, but which was later acquired by Taylor and Francis. Um, and today I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned uh, over the past 25 years, especially the things that have happened since about 2008. About the time publishers appeared, which I later termed predatory, most of the publicly available information about scholarly open access publishing comes from open access advocates, and the information they release serves chiefly to serve their narrow interests and is not balanced. I aim to even the playing field and provide a more complete and balanced view of the status quo of scholarly open access publishing. Uh, my first published work about predatory publishers was in 2009, and I coined the term predatory publisher in 2010. Since 2012, I have authored a WordPress blog about questionable open access publishers and journals, though I had a less formal blog on a different platform before then. My blog contains what is essentially a blacklist of publishers. Additionally, I maintain a second list of what I call 
uh, predatory standalone journals. These started to appear in late 2011 and early 2012 and are single journals that appear in a website by themselves and not under the banner of any publisher. There are some fleets of standalone journals that are clearly owned by the same person and created using the same template, but without any website that unites them all, and this is probably a strategy to make it more difficult for me to track them and list them, and it's an effective strategy. I should also report that I've added a few subscription journals and publishers to my list. I do this rarely and only in cases where the publisher operates like a predatory open access publisher, spamming and charging author fees, but then, unlike OA publishers, locking up and selling the content. It's possible that some publishers who intend to scam are using the subscription model to avoid being placed on my list, which until last year only included open access publishers and journals. Uh, I have, now have over 700 publishers on my publisher list and over 600 journals on the standalone journal list. Um, I generally try to limit my list to the worst of the worst, and the number of predatory publishers and journals continues to grow at a fast pace. Uh, in 2014, I added two new lists to my blog. One is of hijacked journals. These are usually impact factor journals for which someone has created a fake counterpart website on the Internet. In other words, it's almost exactly a counterfeit journal. They spam for articles, accepting all or most of them. Um, journal hijackers generally target journals with impact factors, and they copy all the information from the authentic journal onto their website, including the ISSN, the address, and even the telephone number. The list of hijacked journals currently has about 30 entries. I think most of the victims of hijacked journals are in the Middle East, uh, where publishing in an impact factor journal is essential for academic success and where academic competition is fierce due, due to overpopulation and the scarcity of academic positions. Uh, 2014 also saw the emergence of companies that supply fake impact factors to predatory publishers, uh, metrics the publishers then use in their spam email to attract article submissions. Now it seems that almost all of the predatory journals advertise impact factors, but in almost all cases, the values are contrived. They are pure inventions. I think that many researchers who have responded to the spam emails in which fake impact factors have been advertised truly believe that they have published an article in an impact factor journal. A few predatory publishers themselves have also entered into the fake impact factor business and have, and have even assigned impact factors to their own journals, metrics they then advertise. In the cases where these fake metrics companies reveal their calculation methodologies, we see they are largely subject, subjective and award points uh, for things like having articles in English. The result is that the impact factor is becoming watered down and in some research cultures may have decreased in value as pretty much Everyone now publishes in high impact factor journals, at least according to the journal's websites. Here on the screen, and there's supposed to be an image there, and I'm not sure why it's not appearing, uh, I've copied a part of the website of the international uh, journal Impact Factor. It's, it's still supposed to be on the previous uh, slide. Or the IJIF, a supplier of fake metrics. There are a couple dozen other companies like this, and they are fooling many. Uh, many predatory journals prominently advertise their fake impact factors on their websites and in their spam emails. Okay, now. Uh, predatory publishers are those that exploit the gold open access model for their own easy profit. It's not just the predatory publishers that are benefiting from gold open access, for I'm now seeing an increased use of predatory journals by individuals and pressure groups to promote uh, unscientific political agendas such as that done by act anti-nuclear activists. Also, some use predatory journals to promote unefficacious medical compounds they want to make appear effective. Some use predatory journals to cheat on the rules of taxonomy, the naming of species by naming species after themselves in articles or otherwise cheating at taxonomy. And many complicit researchers use predatory journals to get fast and easy academic credit. Gold Open Access also focuses the costs on the authors of individual papers. The subscription model spreads out the costs, allowing for greater investment to be made in the value-added components of the publishing process, such as professionally managing peer review, copy editing, and the management of authorship disputes. Predatory publishers are having a particularly strong and negative effect on the biomedical sciences, just ask any biomedical researcher with an email address. They have grant funding that they can use to pay author fees, so they receive dozens of spam emails each week 
uh, from journals hoping to collect part of their grant money for the author fees. Biomedical sciences researchers are particularly tired of the incessant spam they receive, tired of having to figure out whether a particular journal or publisher is authentic or counterfeit, and tired of having to exclude junk science from search results in databases and the indexing services they search. Open access advocates lump OA journals both with author fees and without author fees as gold open access so they can make the claim that many open access journals do not charge any author fees. But saying that many OA journals don't charge author fees is not telling the whole truth and may be misleading. I think it's better to employ a nomenclature that makes the distinction between journals that charge authors and those that don't, especially since it's the author fees that have led to the appearance and persistence of predatory journals. Therefore, for journals that are free to the reader and free to the author, I call these platinum open access journals. For journals that are free to the reader and have a fee charged to the author upon acceptance, I call these gold open access journals. And as a mnemonic device, you might say that gold open access is akin to graffiti, for the author pays all the costs associated with its publication, but it's completely free to the readers, as is the case with the graffiti on this stoplight control box in my neighborhood in Denver. Graffiti is an example of gold open access. The Budapest open access statement and the copycat statements that followed were cleverly designed to serve as a substitute for thought, a design that has proven successful. It's so easy to be an open access advocate for it requires no thinking. You merely repeat what others have said. You repeat the statement. The Budapest Open Access Initiative shrewdly applied knowledge of cognitive science to create and publish a manifesto that has come to serve as a substitute for thought. Indeed, many of us have observed for over the 12 years since the statement was first published that when neophytes want to signal they're joining the open access movement, they simply repeat the statement and the ideas encapsulated in the Budapest Open Access Statement to others, usually using social media. Uh, such as a blog or a website. That is to say, one signals one's joining the open access movement by openly repeating the manifesto, and this is done without any real thinking going on. One's repetition of the statements and its ideas is immediately rewarded with a chorus of approval and acceptance and sometimes applause. I can tell you that critical thinking about open access is confronted with derision and attacks. The open access movement has a volunteer police department that quickly and aggressively responds to any criticism of the open access publishing model. Universities claim to teach critical thinking, but academics will attack any criticism of open access that is off-brand. I think that Far too much scholarly research on OA uses the directory of open access journals as a source of research data, eliminating most predatory publishers from the studies, yet claiming that the studies cover all of open access publishing. Thus, the study results give an unbalanced measure of scholarly open access publishing. In other words, many studies do not study the entire population of OA journals. They study only those in DOAJ, a purportedly quality-controlled curated database. I believe that open access advocates are singularly targeting the subscription-based uh, scholarly publishing industry while ignoring other industries that operate in the same manner. In other words, the open access movement really aims to bring down a single industry, subscription journals, and this is its true mission, even if the journals are functioning well. The evidence indicates the movement is not based on principle, for if it acted according to principle, it would apply the same standards to companies like OCLC that exploit libraries by copywriting content the libraries create and reselling it back to them, essentially the same business model of uh, subscription journals. This industry-specific targeting has been described by David Wojcik, a scholarly publishing consultant who wrote in the scholarly kitchen, quote, the open access movement seeks the moral high ground so it vilifies those people who have dedicated their lives to the scholarly publishing industry's mission, in this case, scholarly communication. Movements need enemies, it seems. It is sad but standard, and there is little the industry can do to stop it. Meanwhile, the good work must go on. He continues, 
As I said above, I doubt that making your processes more sound will blunt these attacks. I have seen other industries try this, and it seldom helps, because once a social movement gets you in its sight, the reality matters little. I recommend defending yourselves rather than agreeing that things need to change, end quote. I agree with his advice and recommend that you stand firm in producing and marketing the high-quality journals that you publish. Only in the open access movement would one encounter the concept of mandate strength. Let me explain. Mandates are requirements uh, imposed on researchers to publish in open access journals or to archive their post prints in repositories. Here in the slide is a table of mandate strength taken from an article by Stephen Harned. I think such an indicator clearly signals that there is something amiss. Researchers do not want to be mandated to do things. They want freedom to publish what they want, where they want. Mandates bring about new bureaucracies and managerialism. If the only way to achieve open access is through an oppressive social movement and by force through oppressive mandates, then I think we need to rethink the entire idea of open access. I don't want to be part of any movement that needs mandates to work and mandates that only benefit a certain few. I want fewer mandates and more freedom to publish in outlets that I choose for myself. We know that open access advocates have successfully enacted legislation in North America and Western Europe that requires that research be published in an open access venue in some cases. I believe that more such legislation is unfortunately in the works. Open access publishing requirements enacted by governments are in their own way an assault on the freedom of the press. In fact, I think the open access movement is one of the largest attacks on the freedom of the press in the history of civilization. Open access advocates are successfully using legislation and government regulation to promote and favor one scholarly publishing business model over another. This, in effect, limits or removes the freedom of the press, freedom of publishers to operate in the manner they choose, and therefore gives government sanction to a publishing model open access advocates prefer. The courts here in the U.S., indeed in this very district, have dealt with a similar issue before. So let's compare this to the case of newspaper boxes being regulated by cities and how the Supreme Court ruled on two cases. And here I'm quoting from an attorney named David L. Hudson, Jr. He says, quote, the U.S. Supreme Court has twice decided cases involving news racks. In its 1988 decision, City of Lakewood versus Plain Dealer Publishing Company, the high court invalidated a city ordinance that gave the mayor unbridled discretion to determine whether publishers could place news racks in various locations. The city ordinance provided that the mayor could deny a news rack permit and require publishers to abide by, quote, such other terms and conditions deemed necessary and reasonable by the mayor. This provision, the court said, gave the mayor, quote, unfettered discretion to issue permits to certain newspapers and deny permits to others. To, this, the, to the court, this was unacceptable under the First Amendment, end quote. In the next case, again reading from Hudson, quote, the court next addressed the subject of news racks in its 1993 decision, uh, City of Cincinnati versus Discovery Networks Incorporated. The city revoked the news rack permits of those publications it called commercial handbills. Thus, the city allowed traditional newspapers to remain in news racks, but required the removal of other publications that were devoted primarily to advertising. The city justified its ordinance on its legitimate interests in safety and aesthetics. The city argued it was only revoking the permits for the papers of lesser value. The Supreme Court responded, quote, in our view, the city's argument attaches more importance to the distinction between commercial and non-commercial speech than our cases warrant and seriously underestimates the value of commercial speech. The city also argued that it had the power to ban news racks, that surely it could also limit the number of news racks. The court disagreed, asserting that, quote, even if we assume that the city might entirely prohibit the use of news racks on public property, as long as this avenue of communication remains open, these devices continue to play a significant role in the dissemination of protected speech, end quote. Again, open access advocates have successfully gotten much legislation enacted that favors one particular publishing model to the detriment of the other. This is an attack on the freedom of the press, I believe. Governments should not favor a particular publishing model over another, regardless of who funded the research being published. I think the court precedent I just read is applicable. 
The government has no business enacting laws or regulations that legislate preferences for a particular publishing model. It's in the Constitution. A lot of publishers attack me personally for adding them to my list of questionable publishers. And one of the tactics some use to force me to remove them from my list is what's called the heckler's veto. What they do is they email my library director, uh, my university chancellor, and various other university officials and try to convince them that I'm hurting the university. They try to influence uni university officials to quiet me or fire me by annoying or heckling them with numerous emails. They hope that the university will be so tired of getting complaints about me that they will shut me up in order to make the publisher's complaints stop. Uh, as you can see, the strategy has not been successful, but it is annoying for me and others at my university. One of the publishers that has used this strategy is called the Clute Institute. It's based in Littleton, Colorado, near Denver. Despite its name, it's not really an institute. It's just sort of a mom-and-pop publishing operation with 17 business and education journals. The Clute Institute is not a member of Crossref and therefore does not assign DOIs to the many articles it publishes. For journal articles, they charge both submission and author fees, and their submission fees have an expedited option. You can pay more and get a much quicker peer review. I've shown that they do stealth retractions, and the owner has dealt with plagiarism reports by going into the PDFs and adding quotation marks around the lifted paragraphs in the published papers. At one point, the entirety of this publisher's FAQ page was about me. That is, every single FAQ was about me, and I found this to be thuggery or bullying. Imagine the uproar there would be if your FAQ attacked an open access advocate. This is an example of a, a publisher that has very effectively uh, exploited the pressure to publish. Pretty much every college or university has a business school or at least a business department so there are thousands of business faculty who need to publish to meet academic requirements or earn tenure or promotion. Venal publishers like the Clued Institute meet this need by providing easy publishing opportunities, but I think all they do is pollute academia with low quality and questionable research. Clued also organizes lucrative for-profit conferences, including the one shown here, which will be held later this year in Las Vegas, of course. The owner of this firm has emailed my library director, trashing me and attempting to make me look like a liability to the library, and I'm happy to report that my library director sees right through this tactic, the heckler's veto. There are many predatory journals in the field of business. For many years, some business schools had used included in Cabell's or included in Ulrich's as their lone measure of journal quality. Publish in a journal listed in Ulrich's and you get academic credit. Again, the business management field is saturated with faculty needing to publish, and predatory publishers have greatly helped meet this need, unfortunately. So this leads me to one of the most serious problems that predatory publishers cause, the breakdown of research cultures. By research cultures, I refer to the traditions and practices of scholarly research, including those practices that work to ensure the authenticity, soundness, and importance of research. Predatory journals are destroying established research cultures in many universities, countries, and regions. The role of hard work, originality, and merit in determining promotion or in tenure or other academic advancement is declining as being replaced by the ability to purchase easy publishing in predatory journals. Traditionally, hard work, originality, and merit have been demonstrated through scholarly publication, which provides certification, validation, and the sharing of one's research among other researchers. But because predatory journals have corrupted scholarly publication, they have damaged the certification and validation function uh, scholarly publishing provided. This damage has polluted all of scholarly communication. Indeed, author side payments have introduced much corruption into the institution and traditions of scholarly publishing. I regularly receive emails from chairs of tenure committees asking me about particular predatory journals, and they frequently describe a tenure case they're considering. And the cases often involve a researcher who has a lot of publications in a single easy journal or multiple articles in several journals belonging to a single predatory publisher. I believe there are many cases, including at colleges and universities here in North America, where faculty have earned tenure largely through the quick and easy acceptance of articles that predatory publishers provide. 
In some cases, my understanding is that political correctness plays a role, and a tenure committee questioning the quality of a journal published in a developing country might be seen as racist, so credit is granted notwithstanding the quality of the journal to avoid any possible appearance of racism. How do we resolve this problem? Libraries and other subscribers cannot cancel a subscription to a useless OA journal like they can with subscription journals. Predatory journals saturate academic life comprehensively from spam emails soliciting manuscripts and editorial board service to junk articles appearing in Google Scholar search results. Predatory publishers work for the authors and don't care much about the readers. The voice of the consumer in scholarly research, the readers and subscribers, is essentially lost in gold open access publishing. The certification function of scholarly publishing is badly damaged and threatens to completely break down. In fact, it has disappeared in many countries. In fact, um, if you are an honest scholar who understands that the research process from bench to final publication takes a long time, you still must compete with cheaters at your university who exploit predatory journals and get easy credit for tenure and promotion and for good annual evaluations. The cheaters write quickly prepared articles and submit them to predatory publishers. Ever nimble, there are many predatory publishers that specialize in quick and cheap publishing. You can get published in less than a month for $200. They publish just about anything. In a blog post, I exposed one case in which an Albanian scholar was the co-author on six articles in a single issue of a journal. Cases like this are the rule in regions where research cultures have broken down. The biggest victims are the honest researchers. Some organizations have found a clever way to preserve their income from subscription journals. They simply hire an open access coordinator or advocate who talks a lot about open access all over the place while they keep most of their journals behind a paywall. Others have uh, started a single open access journal chiefly as a means, I think, to silence OA advocates. I think the goal here is to talk about OA just enough and to allow green and a little gold open access just enough to mollify the OA advocates. They never take any action or implement any policy that would cause a reduction in their subscription, subscription revenue, but they certainly talk the talk about open access. The strategy of silencing an open access advocate seems to be a successful business strategy. It largely silences the strident OA advocates but preserves revenue. We see many different implementations of this strategy, and it is amazing that the open access advocates largely accept it. It seems that the open access advocates can largely be bought off with publisher repetition of the open access principles, regardless of whether they change their publishing models to open access. We're still seeing open access promoters using traditional presses in the case of the monograph shown here, a university press to promote open access. Publishing with a traditional press instead of an open access one brings lots of advantages and cachet to the authors, so that's why they publish their OA advocacy books with traditional presses. The press presses offer many impressive value adds, such as a strong distribution network, publicity, and high quality copy editing. The book, this book had a page on Amazon long before it was published, something that doesn't happen with open access, true open access books because they're free, so there's no page on Amazon. I realize that a free PDF of this book was made available, but I think that it's uh, hypocritical to use a traditional press to promote open access. It would be better to just forget about OA and write a book about humanities with your traditional publisher. I've been considering and writing about the value of Google Scholar over the past six months. Because it does not screen for quality and aims to be comprehensive, Google Scholar is full of junk science. It indexes, at the article level, articles from both high-quality and predatory journals, so it includes in its central index all the low-quality and pseudoscience articles that the predatory publishers are so happy to publish in exchange for the payment of the article processing charges. This is a problem because people use Google Scholar for serious research, and some users, such as undergraduates, are not experts and may lack the ability to separate out the junk science from the quality work. Again, Google Scholar is full of pseudoscience. While Google Scholar may be useful for seeking articles by a known author or searching an article when the title is known, a known item search, uh, the database is still the world's most comprehensive index of junk science. The curated index that academic libraries provide do a better job because they selectively index journals, excluding journals they consider low quality or predatory. 
Still, some of these indexes are too inclusive, I think, uh, for they compete for library subscriptions by bragging about the number of journals they cover, a practice that incentivizes the inclusion of some low-quality journals. This is another example of how low-quality open access journals have polluted the world of knowledge management. It's easy to game Google Scholar. By studying predatory publishers, I've learned how to do it, and I'm going to tell you how it's done, but please don't let it leave this room. This slide shows the before and after Google Scholar citation count for Romanian professor Stefan Vladutescu. Before I blogged about his research, he had 1,711 citations in Google Scholar, the top half of the image. Uh, after, I blogged, after my blog post appeared, his citation count dropped to 150. Uh, here's how he originally increased his count. He published articles in easy acceptance, low author fee, predatory journals that were included in Google Scholar like most of them are. The articles he published were mostly nonsense and were four or five pages long. They were written in stream of consciousness style. And then at the end of each article were the references, but these short articles generally had over 50 references. And about 10 of these in each article were to Vladutescu's own previous works scattered among the 50 or so references. So in this way, he was able to quickly and easily increase his citation count by hundreds of articles, effectively gaming Google Scholar metrics. Well, this one instance of Google Scholar has been exposed and they corrected it. I'm certain that there are hundreds or maybe even thousands of other cases effectively rendering most Google Scholar metrics questionable. So this is yet another example of how predatory publishers are corrupting academia and it's evidence that Google Scholar is not a trustworthy source of scholarly metrics, especially when used for the purposes of academic evaluation. Academic librarianship is, in many cases, working contrary to the needs of scholars. My profession is not, in all cases, serving the needs of our campus constituents. And here are some of the problems I see with the current state of academic librarianship. First, there's a certain hubris among academic librarians regarding the ability and appropriateness of academic libraries to take over the role of scholarly publishing. Many still naively believe that scholarly publishing is little more than pushing a button. How will academic libraries as publishers handle ethical conflicts involving a powerful faculty member? Library as publisher will not be impartial or disinterested enough to carry out the role of scholarly publisher in most cases. Second, it's currently very trendy for academic librarians to be politically active in promoting open access publishing. Many academic librarian careerists are advancing simply by being vocal OA supporters and it is politically incorrect to question open access publishing in the academic library environment. As I said, critical thinking about scholarly open access publishing is a punishable offense in the university and academic library community. Only approved critical thinking is allowed. Three, librarians have uh, not been completely honest about the reasons behind increases in journal subscription costs. It's easy to blame the publishers and many will affirm what you say when you do blame the publishers. But this is not telling the whole truth. I think the two biggest uh, factors that have contributed to increases in libraries' journal subscription expenditures are the expansion of science and the increase in the number of scientists, most all of whom need to validate themselves as scholars through publications in scholarly journals. Since the early 1990s, we've seen new scientific fields such as genomics, material science, and nanotechnology. Comprehensive universities need to supply their researchers with current research, and the expansion of science has added to the cost. India has 1.2 billion people, and China has 1.3 billion, and both countries and many others have experienced a great scholarly awakening in the past decade with much valuable and novel research being carried out, research that is being published in scholarly journals, and research that libraries need to make available to their faculty who are building on and competing with these expanding scholarly cultures. It is not just journal price increases that have increased academic libraries' expenditures on published research. And anyone who says otherwise and takes the shortcut of blaming publishers is being intellectually dishonest. Many academic librarians have turned a blind eye to the abuses of predatory publishers for fear of offending open access. 
This neglect on the part of librarians and many others in higher education is one of the factors that has enabled the proliferation of predatory publishers and the abuses they commit. Many academics, uh, not, um, not librarians, uh, sorry, many academics are in a deep, sorry, are in a deep state of denial regarding predatory open access publishing. A recent article in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings by medical ethicist Arthur L. Kaplan says, quote, publication pollution is corroding the reliability of science and medicine, and yet neither the leadership nor those who rely on the truth in science and medicine are sounding the alarm loudly or moving to fix the problem with appropriate energy, end quote. Next, many academic librarians have never done research or published a scholarly article, yet many of these same people uh, purport to be experts on scholarly publishing and on scholarly communication itself. They have the nerve to tell university faculty where and how they should publish, yet they've never been on tenure track and have never done any empirical research. They put their politics before their brains. There is a growing movement called Library as Publisher, and of course it now has its own organization, the Library Publishing Coalition, and it's based on the false premise, uh, I believe, that um, scholarly publishing is as simple as pushing a button, as I mentioned. Many academic librarians sit in comfortable ivory tower offices complacently proclaiming that information wants to be free, yet failing to understand, recognize, and admit to the costs and efforts involved in publishing high-quality scholarship. They also fail to realize that a big part of scholarly publishing involves managing conflicts of interest and dealing with misconduct accusations. Librarians are not in a position to manage these when they involve faculty from their own university. What if a faculty member, a strong supporter of the library, has committed ethical misconduct in an article a library has published? Also, as you know, there are many legal issues involved in scholarly publishing, and most academic libraries are unprepared to deal with such issues. Most library publishing has involved enormous efforts and expenditures with little to show in return. In many cases, the expenditures are much more than what a publisher would charge. My library is currently on its third institutional repository. The first two never really worked. Institutional repositories in many academic libraries are what one librarian has termed publication ghettos. Yes, there's some content in institutional repositories, but it's mediocre and largely ignored. It turns out that the distribution and marketing of scholarly content that the scholarly publishers do so well is really valuable, and librarians perform poorly at these publishing functions. The evidence for this is everywhere. Savvy faculty know that they're not going to improve their H index or their citation count with Word document publications in obscure institutional repositories. Also, many open access journals started by libraries and academic departments are withering and dying. Many were created with great enthusiasm for open access, only to wither or die when the realities of publishing were encountered and realized. Librarians are hypocritical in the way they treat subscription publishers versus the way they treat OCLC and ARL, the Association of Research Libraries. Also, there's a tacit belief among many academic uh, library-related organizations that goes like this. Other publishers should be open access, but we shouldn't have to be because we're special and we really need the income. The open access movement selectively targets subscription journals, uh, demanding that all publicly funded research results be made openly available, but saying nothing about patent rights, another indication that the real purpose of open access is not the, of the movement is not uh, open access, but the pinpoint targeting of a single industry. Moreover, a large portion of the budget in almost every North American academic library goes to OCLC Incorporated, headquartered in Ohio. OCLC resells bibliographic metadata records to academic libraries, records created in many cases by the libraries themselves. These records appear in library online catalogs and are for books and journals. OCLC copyrights its database called WorldCat. Though the records are made available on the internet, they are not available in the MARC format that libraries use, and the terms and conditions attached to the free versions do not permit their use for library cataloging. Again, libraries collectively create the metadata records and contribute them to OCLC's central database, 
but libraries have to purchase subscriptions to OCLC so they can import and use bibliographic records from OCLC central database in their online catalogs. Many, if not most, of the contributing libraries are based at taxpayer-supported universities and colleges, and also one of the biggest suppliers is the Library of Congress. So OCLC is reselling content back to the universities and colleges that paid for it in the first place. Where have we heard this before? Perhaps hypocritically, we almost never hear open access advocates talking about OCLC, even though it operates pretty much the same way as subscription journals do. OCLC resells back to libraries content they paid to create uh, in the first place. So I think it's hypocritical for open access advocates and academic libraries to attack publishers, but give OCLC a pass. How has OCLC managed to keep itself being, from being targeted by academic librarians and open access advocates? It does this basically by buying them off. It sponsors fancy meals at library conferences. It's a nonprofit mega corporation that pays generous salaries to its librarian trustees and board members, and it pays salaries of a quarter million dollars and higher to its many principals. OCLC employs thought leaders that cleverly and carefully direct the conversation away from anything that might affect the revenue that it gets from libraries. Moreover, ARL, the Association of Research Libraries, operates a pressure group called SPARC. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, ARL is also a publisher. It sells statistical data it collects from its member libraries in annual volumes. So it's ironic that one of the largest OA pressure organizations is also a proprietary serial publisher itself. The American Library Association also generates much revenue from its uh, proprietary publishing operations. Again, this is a case of others should be open access, but we don't have to be because we're special and besides, we really depend on the revenue from our publishing program. There is increasing evidence uh, that the author fees charged by open access journals are a barrier to the dissemination of research, and I expect this evidence to grow. Here on the screen, I have some screenshots of three articles and one letter to the editor in scholarly journals. The first one is entitled, uh, Publish or Perish and Pay, the New Paradigm of Open Access Journals. It's, publishers, pu I'm sorry, it's published in Elsevier's journal, journal of Surgical Education, and the authors find, quote, unfortunately, there are many authors without the available funds necessary to publish in open access journals. Many healthcare institutions are under increasingly restricted budgets and are not funding the fees for open access manuscript publication. Next, there was an article published last year in Sage Open that investigated the problems of unaffiliated researchers in the context of author fees in gold open access journals. Writing in the paper's abstract, author Jorgen Burchart concludes that open access, quote, has a type of built-in system failure that prevents research from being published. The study shows that up to 30% of Danish researchers in Danish journals would have problems having their research published in APC-based journals, end quote. The article on the lower left, I'm sorry, it's hard to read, uh, was published in the South African Journal of Science, and it's entitled Open Access in South Africa, A Case Study and Reflections. The article begins with this bold statement. Many South African researchers are unfortunately encountering open access for the first time in negative terms through expensive article processing charges, ellipsis, and through the discourse of regulatory compliance, which is such anathema to the ethos of academic freedom and academic rigor, which all scholars hold dear, end quote. Finally, the letter to the editor on the right is entitled, Open Access Journals, Open for Rich, Closed for Poor. These are the first articles I know about um, that address the money problems with gold open access and with the author fees. I expect there will be more to come, and I expect that most will focus on the negative aspects of author-financed scholarly publishing, especially in middle-income countries where there are no funds for APCs and no waivers for them either, as was mentioned earlier today. So the system of payments from authors is corrupting scholarly communication. Author-financed publishing models have spawned numerous new corrupt businesses that range from predatory publishers to hijacked journals to suppliers of fake impact factors. Science itself is threatened 
and demarcation is failing and junk science is being published and is mingled with legitimate science in popular search engines. Unfair government legislation and regulation favors one kind of publisher over another, limiting the freedom of the press. Most of the information about scholarly open access publishing comes from open access zealots who are singularly targeting subscription journals and who give a biased view of open access, a view that benefits their own interests. The field of academic librarianship has lost its way and naively thinks it can take over the role of scholarly publishers. Open access advocates unfairly give a pass to companies that operate using the same models as subscription journal publishers. The high quality work you do is greatly valued by the academic and research communities, so please persevere. For the sake of science, technology, and medicine, please continue your quality work. Have a good conference. Thank you. Happy to take some softball questions. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, Susie Skomal from Bio One. I'd just like to make a friendly correction. Spark is not owned by ARL. They are now separate organizations. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take the liberty to ask a question. Okay. Uh, what have you done over the last three years to more formalize your list of predatory journals and getting advice from uh, various folks in the scholarly publishing industry? Um, I benefit from uh, contributions from people all over the world who share information with me through email um, about new journals, uh, new publishers that are questionable. Uh, in addition, um, I have a six-page criteria uh, for determining predatory publishers, and I recently updated it. It's now in the third edition. Um, I have a lot of mentors that help me and try and keep me out of trouble, um, which are, they're mostly successful with. So. Well, your list is a very popular list, as you know. It's watched very closely. Um, have you thought about formally organizing your list into a nonprofit organization focused on this area of quality of science, of scholarly publishing? Yeah, some have recommended <clears throat> that I do that, but the reason I don't do it is um, right now the university lawyers, who I'm on a first name basis with, um, <laughs> if they, they help me if I have problems or they represent me. If I form a nonprofit, then they wouldn't be able to do that. I'd have to hire the own, the own lawyers. And I don't have an income. There was no income source for that. So that's why I haven't done that. And also, um, there'd be a conflict of interest if I was like taking donations to, to fund the nonprofit. I'm sure that some of the publishers would be happy to contribute you know, if, if I gave them a Get special... Get us off the list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So that's why I haven't done that. Uh, let's go to Brandon, and then we'll go to Jerry. Yeah. Brandon? I'd just like to, I guess, either challenge or f have you flesh out your um, assertion about uh, there's increasing evidence that the cost of APCs is an actual barrier to information distribution, inasmuch that many of the publishers here have a model that even for um, uh, authors that wish to uh, publish in a traditional journal um, with no APCs up front can, at some point thereafter, through an embargo process, uh, self-deposit in a IR, uh, whether that's a, a small institutional IR or a large aggregator like PMC. Yeah, so, right, that's green open access is what you're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, one, one definition. Yeah. One of the reasons I didn't give, I didn't cover green open access at the beginning when I covered um, platinum and gold is just because I don't see green open access as, as taking off. Um, I don't see a big um, enthusiasm for it among the faculty at my university. Uh, there's embargo periods. You have to do it. You can't uh, publish the publisher's final PDF. That's not the copy edited version. Um, I don't think that green open access has been as successful as advertised. I hope that addresses what you're saying. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks for a, a great talk. 
Uh, one claim, uh, I'm Jerry Grenier of the IEEE, uh, one claim of open access advocates is that um, uh, by virtue of being open, um, exposure is gained and in, in increased and therefore the citations for that author are increased. And it's one claim that I've found has not been proven um, and I'm not sure that there's been much research in that area. Just your thoughts? Um, yeah, David Crotty addressed this earlier today and I agree that there, you do get more downloads but there's no conclusive evidence that you get more citations when the paper's open access. The, the publisher's big deals have essentially duplicated open access for most people, most universities, at least in uh, Western countries. Um, and then there's Hinari, uh, you know, in other countries. So, um, so that's it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Yes, Brandon. Yeah, if you'd given this speech five years ago, I think you'd have been sort of carried down the aisle and straight to the bar, and uh, you wouldn't have bought a drink all night. Uh, but most of us have had to, um, you know, some of us have drunk the Kool-Aid of o OA, and some of us have uh, bowed to the political pressures that you mentioned, um, uh, whether it's political or the funder-mandated pressures. Um, so, you know, we, in many cases, a lot of us have some level of OA uh, compliant programs. Um, but certainly, you know, as I go to conferences, you know, you'll see almost the next wave of sort of purity tests on, around OA uh, or next issues that says, you're not truly OA unless you allow TDM. Clearly has come up. And I'm wondering if you see what are the, some of these other um, items that are likely to uh, come up and have potentially the same level of advocacy and the same level of um, um, guerrilla, emotive, you know, maybe non-critical thinking advocacy that you attribute to the first wave of open access? I don't know. Um, I'm, I just, I'm drawing a blank on that. The, the thing that I thought about when you were asking the question is that no matter how successful open access is, the problem of junk science is growing and that's going to pollute open access and pollute all of science, and that's what's happening right now. Um, there's a lot more junk science out there, I think, than people realize, and it's in, it's in, it's in Google Scholar. Uh, pe you know, people are accessing it, and a lot of people aren't able to distinguish it from legitimate science. So regardless of how successful open access is, the other problems surrounding it are increasing, especially in other countries. Uh, especially in Eastern Europe and the Middle East and uh, South Asia, um, where it's a completely different world than here. And there's a lot of people publishing, thinking that they've published in, in impact factor journals, and the impact factors are completely fake. So I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer to your question than that. Hello, Peter Ashman, BMJ. Just a, a further comment on the issue of author fees being a barrier to publication, I think it's worth acknowledging that uh, the scholarly publishing community give very generous waivers to, um, to authors, particularly from low to middle income countries, who have been big supporters of Hinari. So at BMJ, we automatically give waivers to people from Hinari countries. So I think it's just worth acknowledging that actually we still continue to do that. Thanks. It's the middle income countries that are, that are uh, suffering the most because they don't have money, they don't have funds for article processing charges and there's no waivers. So I'm talking about countries like Mexico and Brazil, uh, even uh, India, for example. There's no way for, for many of them to publish in, in open access journals. Yeah, Don. Don, Don Samuelak from Editage. I'd like to tie in a couple of last comments and, uh, and tie it also into a session that's tomorrow afternoon on early career challenges. Uh, that I'll be involved with with others. The, uh, I was at the University of Montreal, uh, I guess it's a couple of weeks ago, and I, I did a focus group for about four hours with about 25 postdocs. And, uh, and we had a lot of dialogue about a lot of things. But one of the things that clearly came up was APC charges. And, and um, now putting this in a frame of reference, the University of Montreal, you guys probably don't know, but the, 
the students revolt uh, against a lot of things, including costs of education and, and whatever. And I'm from Montreal, so I can say that. Um, but then I explained to them, with respect to the, um, the integrity of the literature, what publishers are actually doing with use of authentic cross-ref, whatever, or, or cross-check, uh, and that the publisher really is the, um, the, uh, the doorkeeper of the integrity of the literature. And, and I explained through this whole process that nothing's free, and while open access may have uh, charges associated with it, that supports the journal. The journal is supporting the literature, and, and you go through the whole gambit. And they started, you could see their wheels turning, aha, uh -huh, I understand this. And, and so I say this just to throw out one concept, is that the publishing community, the journals, may not be doing enough of a, of a um, relations campaign to say that really they are the gatekeepers, the ethical publishers and the ethical journals are the gatekeepers to ensure the integrity of the scholarly literature. And that comes with a cost. And the authors, whether in any commercial enterprise, someone has to pay for something on the front end to get something on the back end, whether it's, whether it's paying for a widget or paying for a service. Ultimately, the publishers are using that bag of money and are doing something good about it. And, and I think that's a, a message that's never really brought up that was very clearly needed to be brought up in front of young career investigators who just see it as a, a barrier to publication. Um, Catherine Spiller from Bioscientifica. I just wondered how you would like to see the predatory publishers dealt with. What would be your solution? What would you like to see happen to them? I think the best thing to do is to educate uh, researchers about the problems of, edit, of predatory publishers so that they avoid them. I don't think that there should be any regulation. They, um, they too benefit from the freedom of the press. So in many cases, the freedom of the press includes to be a low quality publisher. Um, sometimes they do violate the law. For example, when they add somebody's name to an editorial board without the person's permission, that might be a form of identity theft. So those cases, I think, should be prosecuted, although it's almost impossible to do it because they do it overseas and the people complaining are in another country. Um, so education and awareness of predatory publishers and predatory journals, I think, is the, is the only way that I know, and that's what I'm trying to do, is make people aware of them so they avoid them and so they don't become victims of them, because the predatory publishers victimize researchers. Uh, Jane Marks, Waters Clearer. I wonder if there's any connection from what you were saying between um, what we're seeing more and more is ethical issues coming up. It feels like um, you know, early in my career, if you had one case of plagiarism a year, it was, it was, it was quite something. It was something that, that we paid attention to and obviously had to deal with, but it was unusual. It feels like it's almost every week now that something will come up, and some of the scams that authors try on regular journals are, are astounding. Um, and I wonder if the way that, that open access and perhaps these predatory publishers are gaining momentum, do you think it's having an impact on the, the rise of um, unethical scholarly uh, process? Yes, absolutely. I believe that it is. I don't uh, have any statistics to cite to prove it, but it's definitely a feeling. When I analyze predatory publishers and journals for possible inclusion in my list, I always check for plagiarism. I've I'm, I'm gotten really good at finding it. I know where to look for it. And, find it, and it's, it's all over the place among the lower quality journals. Um, some of them do no checking at all for plagiarism. We have time for one quick question or yeah, comment. It's uh, a question, and, or it's more of an announcement in the sense that a lot of the fraud that's coming is an, another wave that uh, Jeffrey has actually pointed out and that I'm also picking up on is predatory author services. So the predatory author services are creating another secondary wave of fraud that isn't instigated by the author necessarily, but by a company that is providing fraudulent services. And I'm going to be addressing this with uh, Hazel Newton at the ICMT meeting this August on a session on predatory author services. Uh, and it, there, there's only one solution that I can think to do it, and, and it's going to be a community solution, and that is we together have to band and 
figure out some way to build a consortium of ethical author services or a badge that's verifiable for ethical author services because I honestly believe in two years' time, the average researcher, when you have predatory through the whole axis of publication and author services, they will not be able to identify what's ethical and what's predatory in two years' time. And that's a scary thing, and education cannot happen fast enough to head that off. Very good comments indeed, indeed. And let's give our keynote speaker a round of applause for a very good... <laughs>